since Lights Out was my very first feature and also my one shot at Hollywood, I wanted to make sure that I was as prepared as I could possibly be. So once we had our main location, the, the house where most of the movie takes place, I asked during pre-production if I could go there and just walk around the, the house for a few hours and just figure out where certain scenes would take place and, and how to shoot them, especially the scary scenes, since they were very important. Uh, and they let me do that. Uh, so I, I, I brought my little camera and just walked around the house and sort of talk to myself going through uh, the very scary scenes in the film. Goes to the door and he sees over there that wall inside that room is lit from this side, you know. And he hears talking coming from there. So, walks across here. Turns the corner into his mom's room. I just don't know what to do about it. I, I'm so sorry. I, I, I really don't. And he sees her standing here, you know, talking to someone inside the closet. Now, I'm thinking maybe we actually remove this door if we can create like just a black void in here uh, gonna take a bit i think that would be better because with a black void you know you know, never know what something could just pop out of there as opposed to you know having a door like a barrier between you and you know the ghost so she's talking to someone in the black void. She tells him to, you know, go back to bed and all of that. He's freaked out, so he starts walking back to his room. He hears like a creak or something behind him. Turns back and sees a silhouette standing in the doorway. But it's just Sophie. She's like, you know, yeah, go, go on, go back to bed. But then we see a much taller silhouette just start peeking in from over here. Good night, Martin. But, you know, we never see her fully come out because Martin's so freaked out. You know, he starts running back to his room. Looking at these sort of before and after shots, you can see the importance of, of production design. You know, just the, the furniture, the wallpaper, the colors, uh, which is all thanks to production designer Jennifer Spence. And um, I did, what you just saw was pretty much what I did for a few hours that day, just walking around and figuring things out. And then I, I sent these videos to the studio to show what I plan to do. So he walks over here with the candle, opens the door up, candle almost blows out. He starts moving out here. Since this room is over here, he has the longest way to go, except if he was over there, I guess. He has the longest way to go to get downstairs. So... He walks out here, maybe he has, you know, they put the, all these flashlights and all these stuff in like flower pots and just hiding them everywhere. So maybe he goes for like the flower pot where he, they hit a flashlight earlier, but of course now it's gone because, I don't know, Diana took it or something. He hears a noise behind him. We have light coming through there on that wall. So we have a silhouette standing here who can sort of run towards him. He starts running. 
Now, part of that scene changed a little bit because on the day we were shooting it, James Wan was on the set and he came up with this idea of having two Dianas in one long, unbroken shot. So, you know, we would see Diana pop up behind Martin and then without making any cuts, she would suddenly be in front of him. So that's what we did instead. And we, we used our both our real Diana actress, and but also the, the stand-in we had for our Diana. We you know, put a wig on her and made her look sort of like Diana. And he falls, you know, maybe here, maybe there. Falls, he tries to protect the light and, you know, he gets pulled back by Diana. Now that's pretty much where the scene ends in the film, but originally I figured we'd actually sort of follow Martin down the stairs as well. And maybe we have like these shafts of light creating like a safe zone where he could, you know, catch his breath standing in this safe zone with Diana being right outside. I guess the cheesy version would be that if that's moonlight, creating a safe sound and you know clouds will come in front of the moon and now he's fucked and he has to keep going with his light I don't know um right now an important scene in the film to figure out was scene 91 which is where uh we first get to see Diana down in the basement once they find the UV light you can find a bunch, a bunch of shit in here we're just in this room as well, just to burn, and they find the UV light. And then, you know, Rebecca has the UV light. So she goes to take inventory or whatever the phrase was, where she, you know, goes looking for stuff. So she could walk into this room, which is already creepy because of this door. She comes in here with the UV light, and she sees on this wall you know, all of Diana's writing that now shows up in UV light. So this wall is, is like covered with writing. And I'm thinking that the writing is actually made up of Diana's fingerprints. So it was like that scene in Seven, you know, where uh, they find the help me written with fingerprints when they shine a UV light on it, sort of like that. So, you know, because she's been down here a long time and she's had time to just write all over these walls with her fingers. So Rebecca sees that, and then she sees, you know, on her clothes that Diana, she actually has, you know, Diana's actually been on her as well. So she goes down here, follows sort of all the, uh, uh, let me turn on the light. Sees, follows all the writing. She turns around here, maybe we can build up some, put some shelf or just boxes or whatever here. Comes around like here and there's like a whole group of silhouettes, you know, the, she, she freaks the fuck out, you know. But no way, it's just, it's a bunch of mannequins because, you know, of Paul's business and all that. But there's something weird about him. So, you know, she approaches these mannequins and she sees that. Diana's fingerprints are over them, and when she gets close to the face of the first mannequin, she sees that there's like, you know, scratches over the eyes, and she's, Diana's been sort of taking out her aggressions on this mannequin. And so, and the, you know, like the mannequin next to that is sort of turned away a bit, so she sort of goes around, checks out the face on that, and that one's even worse, you know, the eyes have been poked out. It's just like these broken holes and you see this, you know, really freaky stuff she's been doing to the mannequins. So there's like a row of mannequins, a couple of them that are destroyed. And then one of them, you know, has, is turned away and has this really long hair. And Rebecca sort of has this UV light. She sort of turns around and then this mannequin turns around because it's Diana, you know, like, <sighs> she runs away. Rebecca, like, freaks out, so she falls down. And 
Yeah, now they've figured out that she's visible in UV light. Now, if you've seen the film, you might have noticed that that's not the actual room where we did end up shooting the scene. That's because um, the, when talking to the production designer about it, she said, you know, if you shoot it in the wine cellar, you'll actually have a longer room to work with, and you already have sort of these shelves or this sort of barricade dividing the room. So we, we moved it to that location instead. We also have the wine cellar, which is kind of cool. That's a good thing about this basement that it actually has all, all these rooms. Because, you know, you can have Rebecca leave Martin by the furnace. Um, and he would, of course, be anxious, you know, calling out for, Hey, Rebecca! She's like, shut up, Martin. Um, and you have all of these little holes and stuff like that, you know, if Martin... <laughs> He could be looking out here, checking what Rebecca's doing or whatever. So once we knew where the scene would take place, I did storyboards uh, for, for that scene. Uh, not very good looking storyboards, but I had a lot of storyboards I wanted to do, so I couldn't like care too much about what they looked like. And in fact, even though I didn't spend a lot of time on each panel, I still ran out of time. So eventually the storyboards that I did last were just hastily scribbled together things that I sort of had to explain to people what they actually were. Um, but once I had storyboards for cer certain scenes, like scene 91, I put them together in, in story reels, which is, I, I guess, more of an animation thing, but it's basically where you take the, the storyboard panels and put narration on them. And it looked like this. Rebecca takes the black light and heads for the other rooms of the basement. Martin doesn't want her to go. Rebecca tries to reassure him. She's just going to take inventory. She'll be right back. Wait. Where are you going? To take inventory. Keep feeding the fire. With Martin behind her, she can let down her mask of bravery that she's been doing her best to put on in front of Martin. Rebecca sees that in the black light she can see Diana's handprints all over the basement. Rebecca looks down. <gasps> There's a handprint on her as well. Martin heard her gasp and wonders what happened. Rebecca tries to brush off the handprint. Nothing happened. Everything's fine. Everything is not fine. But Rebecca forces herself further into the darkness. She enters a long and narrow room. She discovers that the black light reveals writing on objects and walls in this room. This is Diana's writing, and it's all over the room. It's like a prisoner's journal giving us a glimpse into Diana's mind. Rebecca goes in for a closer look. The writing is made up of Diana's fingerprints. She's been down here a long time. Rebecca moves further down into the room where- <gasps> There's people down here! Wait a minute. 
They're mannequins. But hang on. Something's weird. Rebecca goes in for a closer look. The mannequin's eyes have been scratched out, and Diana's handprint covers the mouth. Rebecca goes to the next mannequin that's facing away from her. Rebecca's POV as we swing around the mannequin for a closer look. This one looks even worse. Its eyes and mouth have been carved out, and there are scratch marks all over. Rebecca continues on and slowly approaches the next mannequin. <laughs> the mannequin turned around to face us. That was Diana. Rebecca runs away. Now, on the day when we were shooting Rebecca's POV of the mannequins, uh, I wanted to explain to the camera operator exactly what I wanted, so I used my phone to sort of frame it and show him what I wanted. Here, so, I okay. can tell you. so it's her POV, mm -hmm. like she's seen this weird mannequin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She comes closer to that, like looking at, oh, look at that weird stuff, you know, it's Diana. And then she sees this mannequin. It's like, yeah, that's crazy. And then that mannequin is a bit turned away. So we go around that mannequin and we see that. And then here's another mannequin. And Kara, turn to your left like that. And then you head out that way. Okay. okay. Rebecca runs away. We see her through the shelves as she runs. Is this Diana's POV? Is she following? Rebecca heads for the door from where she came, but she stops. A spade could be used as a weapon. Rebecca grabs the spade, but a hand grabs Rebecca. Rebecca struggles to get away, but it's impossible. Bam! A second hand. Diana is crawling through the shelves. Rebecca is freaking the fuck out. She can't get away. Suddenly, a light hits Diana. The light burns Diana's skin. Diana retreats and lets go of Rebecca. Rebecca looks towards the source of the light. It's Martin with the wind-up flashlight that he's cranking as fast as he can. Come on! Martin and Rebecca head back to the safety of the furnace. Now one thing to note in this scene is that I wanted to shoot a lot of it from, from this side, right? And then when Diana comes crawling out, I wanted to jump over to this other side. But on the day, I was told that, no, that's jumping the line, you know, breaking the 180 degree rule, which you shouldn't do. Uh, but I have to admit, I, I don't always get the 180 degree rule. Maybe it's because I didn't go to film school and get it pounded into my head or something, but like I get the basics of it. If you, for example, shoot a conversation between two people and for one side you're over here and then for the other side you're over here, then when you cut it together, it'll look like the characters are all looking the same way, which will be very confusing, right? But I, I, I figured like in, in scenes like this where you've clearly established where everything is, it's not going to be as confusing. But at first I was like all right, I don't want to jump the line, let's shoot it from over here. And we did that. But right after it was like, it's not, it doesn't have the same impact. So, you know, I want to jump the line. But yeah, I, I should probably read up on, on the 180 degree rule because even on my second movie, uh, Annabelle Creation, there were a lot of times when I would go, okay, let's put the camera over here. And then the camera operator would go, oh, David, we actually need to be over here. So we're not jumping the line. But, I don't know. Anyway, that's how a lot of the scenes in, in Lights Out were, were planned out. And that, that's still how I do it now, like how I did on Animal Creation as well. I just didn't shoot it or show anyone uh, what I was thinking. I just, you know, walked around the set when I had the time and figured things out.